Every year, as I continually make pots, there are always some vessels that I particularly like, together with those that didn't really work out. Sometimes you don't realise that until the end, after the piece has been fired, and that's what this video will document the creation of. During this time, I was throwing a series of larger lidded jar forms, mostly from this soft reclaimed clay, and this mass is made up from all the trimmings from previous pots. At this point it's full of air pockets, and is very inconsistent in terms of texture, the outside being quite firm, and the inside especially soft, so before it can be thrown with, this clay needs to be wedged up really thoroughly. Wedging is what we call the process of kneading clay, and by folding it over on itself, rhythmically, like this, all the air pockets are slowly popped, and both the soft and the hard clay is mixed together. And I keep repeating this process until the entire mass is one perfect, even texture, and until there are no air pockets left inside, as these bubbles only make the throwing process more difficult during the next stage, as the voids create thin patches and inconsistencies in the walls, which are only stretched and made worse as the process continues. So I try my best to get rid of as many of them as possible before I begin throwing. Next, this lump of clay is thrown onto the wheel and centred. In this case I'm working on what's called a throwing back. This is an additional platform that's attached to the top of your wheel head. In this case I'm using a simple round of MDF that's secured in place by being stuck onto a thin skim of leather hard clay that's slightly wetted so the MDF adheres to it. By throwing this way, once the pot's finished, I don't have to remove only the pot itself from the wheel head. Instead I can just lift the MDF platform away, carrying the thrown vessel with it, neatly and without any distortions. During the centering process, I cone the clay up and down numerous times. This aligns the minute particles, the placelets, which helps the throwing beyond just centering the clay, as it makes the stoneware easier to move around as it becomes more plastic and almost holds its shape better. After the piece of clay has been coned up and down numerous times, I'll compress it into a thick puck sort of shape, with a flat top and sides, and as I work, I'm keeping my right arm, which is the one I'm anchoring with, incredibly steady by leaning my upper body weight onto it. Once perfectly centred, I'll then sink my thumb and index finger into the middle, creating a well. Once they've pushed deep enough, and there's a base left which is about one and a half centimetres thick, I'll then stop pushing down and I'll glide my fingers horizontally, forming the flat internal base of the jar. If I push down too deep, I'll create a base that's too thin that won't survive the trimming and glazing and firing process. On the other hand, if I leave it too thick, I run the risk of making a pot that's too bottom heavy, if I don't trim away that excess clay at a later point. And at this stage I did find a small air bubble just in the base, which I quickly popped. Next, I collared the walls in slightly, so instead of angling outward, they're now facing up, in the direction I now intend to pull the walls. I don't try and move too much material with my first pull, instead I'm just lightly lifting it, thinning out what would otherwise be a very thick mass of clay to pull up. Typically, when I'm forming the walls of a pot, if it is more of a cylinder as opposed to a bowl, I'll always keep the walls angling inward slightly, instead of splaying out, as it's much easier to throw a pot when the walls are kept under control in a tapering cylinder, as if I did instead throw them so they were angling outward, like the walls of a bowl, I'd need to be constantly collaring them in to get them back into the cylindrical shape, which would mean compressing walls that are more stretched out and thin into a more narrow cylinder with thicker walls, and that process imparts a huge amount of stress into the walls of a pot, and the chances of them buckling or twisting increase dramatically. I pinch into the thicker clay around the base, my left hand pushing a bulge outward, and then together both hands simultaneously move up at a very steady and even rate, forcing the thicker clay walls through a thinner gap between my fingers. And this is a process I'll repeat numerous times, until the walls are tall and evenly thin. On the outside I pull up using a wetted sponge. This helps to keep the clay hydrated, and therefore it runs through my fingers smoothly without sticking to the clay as friction quickly dries them. Each pull is slow and considered. I don't rush, instead I just move at one steady, even pace from bottom to top. Consistency is key here, as if I were to suddenly speed the wheel up whilst moving my hands at the same pace, more clay would pass through my fingertips 
and therefore I would thin out that section of the pot. Equally, if I were to suddenly start moving my hands much faster than I spun the wheel, they'd leave more prominent throwing rings in the walls of the vessel, which again can lead to some issues. And once again I'm just collaring the form in, just to keep the entire shape a bit more under control, as ultimately I want this pot to have straight walls and a shoulder and rim that angle in and create a narrow opening at the top. Before each pull, I soak my sponge up with water and squeeze it over the rim and down the walls. I then push in towards the base and on the inside my fingers are positioned slightly higher than those on the outside. From the inside, they push out to form a bump and it's this bump that I'm then almost carrying and lifting up towards the rim. It's easy just to raise my left arm, but with my right arm that's held tightly into my torso, the movement is really coming from my elbow as opposed to my wrist. And this makes the process of moving my hand up on the outside far easier, as I have a greater range of motion. And here we go again. So I pinch in and push out, and then lift that bulge up. And once I've started, there's no stopping, and I certainly don't want to suddenly move my hands down or up rapidly. Instead, and like I keep saying, they just move slowly and consistently upwards. At this point, I'm already thinking about the final form. And you can see, albeit rough, the straight walls and the top that slopes in slightly. And it's this part I'll be focusing on next, as this part, which we'll call the shoulder, needs to be thrown inwards and the rim formed, which I very gingerly create at this point, just using the tip of my finger, which I push gently into the clay to make a more defined change in angle. And now that the bones of the pot are there, I'll begin to tidy the pot up by removing the skirt of clay from around the base, which is done with an old metal blunted turning tool. Then I'll use the sharp edge of a brass kidney to begin removing much of the slip from the walls of the jar. This is the slippery wet saturated clay that clings onto the wall of the vessel that previously helped it flow through my fingers more easily. And it's at this point that I decided I wanted to make the vessel have a step in the waist. So I dug my index finger into the wall, much like I did at the top when forming the rim. And at this stage it only need be subtle, as I'll be able to more easily define this ledge later on, once the pot is turned leather hard. And all that's left to do now is remove the rest of the slip, and with a pair of calipers, measure the opening at the top. Removing the slip not only refines the form, but as it leaves a drier surface, it'll help the pot to dry out to leather hard more quickly. And as the top was undulating just a little bit too much for my liking, I tried my best to trim the worst of it away. I then chamoisied the rim smooth, cleaned off the back, and then measured the opening so that I can throw a lid to the exact same dimension. I then slide a wire underneath the body of the jar whilst keeping it very taut, and then lift the wooden bat and the thrown pot away with it, setting it aside so that it can slowly dry out to leather hard. The next part I need to make is the lid which is altogether a more simple object. It's thrown quickly and thickly, with a focus on the vertical locating flange, which is the part of the lid that'll slot into the jar below. In hindsight, I did throw this lid larger than I liked, and once trimmed and off camera, I did actually trim it even further, so you may see it suddenly change at a later point in this video. I centre these like normal, and I press the lump into a low disc shape, almost as if I was going to make a plate. I then make a shallow well in the middle and open it up, leaving a very thick wall around it. It's this thick portion which I'll separate into the different components of the lid. But first I square off the central well and compress the clay. Then I use the tip of my index finger to separate the thicker wall into two parts. The flat horizontal portion will sit on top of the rim of the jar and the vertical portion will slot inside it. The most important part though is the corner the two parts make, the approximate right angle, and it's that part that I'll measure. To guarantee the lids fit, I always throw them to be about a millimetre or two larger than need be. That way when both components are leather hard, I can trim away the excess so the two pieces fit perfectly. 
rather than attempting to throw them completely accurately. Once the rough shape is there, I'll begin doing what I always do, which is removing as much of that excess slip as possible. This will help the component dry out more quickly, and it's generally just good practice to leave your pots in a highly finished state. Beyond that, I scrape this slip off the back, and that's this part finished, and they really do only take a minute or two to throw. And in some cases, if I'm throwing a new shape, I'll make a couple of lids of different shapes and sizes. That way I can work out which one works best. And here's just a few of those jars I've been making, all of which are slightly larger versions of pots I've made in the past. And once again, once looking back, there are some significant changes I'd make to these shapes. As once covered in glaze and fired, there was only two or three which I really liked. This is now a few days later. I've been carefully drying out both parts, so they're more or less the exact same consistency for trimming. You don't really want one part to be significantly more dry than the other, as it means they may have shrunk a different amount. And even if they fit at this stage, once bone dry, as they're still drying out at different rates, the parts might not fit perfectly. But I begin by centering the lid, securing it in place, and then testing to see whether the jar fits, which I do by just offering the jar up to the lid, like so. Once it fits, I can begin turning other portions of the lid, which for this particular one, there was quite a lot of material to remove from inside this well, as generally I left all of it a bit too thick for my liking. Trimming internal forms like this is always a bit tricky, as the clay that's removed usually just clogs up on your tool, unless you can lift it away neatly like this. That certainly isn't always the case. With this lid I was even able to undercut a bit, tunnelling into that thicker expanse around the edge. And thankfully, as I'm sure most of you know, all of these trimmings can very easily be recycled back into usable clay. Now the underside of the lid has been trimmed, it's time to move on to the body of the jar. To attach this component to the wheel, I first brush some slip onto the metal and then place the jar onto it, and then I tap center it into place. The slip sort of acts like glue, it dries quickly, holding the pot down, and I also use a rubber kidney just to compress the lower section of the wall into the wheel head before properly beginning to trim. As there is some weight in this vessel, I can be confident it will remain firmly held in place as I trim, especially as it has such a wide base. If I'm trimming pots that have narrow bases, I'm typically a lot more cautious using this method, which means I'll keep my left hand braced on the outside, ready to catch it at a moment's notice if it were to become dislodged. At this point, I'm thinning out the walls, straightening them, and generally just refining the overall shape. And you can easily see the difference just one pass over with the blade makes. And as I'm trimming a pot that's made up mostly of flat surfaces, I make sure I use blades that have a similar profile, and just like pulling up the walls at the throwing stage, my movements when trimming are very even and controlled. I don't move the blade around sporadically, as doing so would impart similar motions on the wall of your pot. As the opening's wide enough and I can fit one hand inside the pot, I'll keep the fingers of my left hand opposite the area I'm trimming. That way I can feel just how thick the walls are as I'm turning. These exceedingly sharp tungsten carbide tools do leave a certain texture and usually, once I finish trimming one specific area, I'll go over it with a flat metal edge, just to burnish and smooth the stoneware. Now it's time to trim the outside and top of the lid, and as it fits so perfectly into the gap, I can use the jar, like a chuck, to trim the lid. But for an added layer of security, I also use the spinner as I turn, which I can apply downward pressure through, which helps keep the lid pinned in place, as there is always the tendency that the lid might leap up if the tool catches, and it's at this stage I can trim away much of the excess in the lid. And like I mentioned earlier, even after this trimming process, I ended up going back and turning the lid to be smaller, as it felt a bit too hefty in its current state, although it does at least provide a few very satisfying moments of trimming. In terms of the angle of the lid, I want the sides to be as flat as the walls beneath it, although with hindsight, and when watching and editing this footage, there were a few moments where I trimmed ledges around the lid that worked really nicely, would be them seen in just short, fleeting moments. This is more or less where I deemed it suitable at this point. So next I moved on to trimming the top 
of the lid. I'll trim this portion to have a very slight concave surface. That way the glaze should pull nicely into it. And I think it also makes for just a slightly more interesting top as compared to if it was just flat. As this surface is curved, I'm using a curved blade and I dig the corner of the curve into the lid and gradually carve out the shape I want. And even though I'm not using my spinner as I'm turning, I still hold the lid down in the middle with my fingertips as I work, just to make sure it stays pinned down. And lastly, I burnish over this section with a curved metal kidney. This compresses in some of those more coarse particles of sand that are exposed as the turning tool rips through the clay. And now the lid has been turned, I finally shift my focus to the shoulder and the rim of the jar. I tend to do this after the lid, as if I finish this portion first and then place the heavier lid on top. There's a chance, or at least it's happened a few times to me, that both the weight of the lid and the pressure from me pushing down with the spinner is enough to cause either the rim or the shoulder to sag slightly or even crack, and simply by doing it afterwards, I negate that problem. So it's trimmed, the edges are burnished, and then all that's left to do is turn the base of the pot. This means I need to remove it from the wheel, which I do by sliding a sharp metal knife beneath it. This dislodges the pot, and then I can assemble the parts once again so that the base is pointing up. I then carefully place the jar onto the lid, secure it in place with three lumps of clay, and then I place my spinner tool on top. As this pot does have quite a wide expanse of clay on the base, if I were to push down with my fingertips in one focused spot, depending on the thickness of the bottom, I may bow it in slightly or distort it. And so by using a spinner here, I can distribute the weight that's being pushed down over a wider area. Once the edge has been beveled, I'll then begin to trim the base itself. For this part, I'm removing many of the wiring off marks left over from when the pot was sliced off the wheel and removed. Ultimately, the base of this pot will be one of the largest areas that still shows what the bare clay looks like, as it has no glaze coated over it. This means if I were to trim it badly, or if I were to leave prominent throwing marks there, or any other bits of clay embedded in this surface, for me, it would feel slightly unfinished, or not properly thought about, which means I tend to finish the basis of my pots to quite a high degree. They're burnished carefully, the clay is smoothed over so the particles are compressed and any coarse lumps that are protruding are pushed back into the body. And finally I stamp the pot with my maker's mark, which I push in slightly and rock from corner to corner so that it leaves a legible impression. And for the time being, that's the jar finished, although a little later and off camera I trim the lid once again just to make it a bit smaller overall. Beyond that, for the next step in this process, I need to dry this pot out until it's in a state we call bone dry. This is when the clay has no more moisture left inside it, and it changes from this dark pink tone to this lighter one. I fire this kiln overnight to 1000 degrees Celsius. This permanently hardens the clay, and from this point onward it can no longer be soaked down and recycled. The only difficulty in this process really of packing the kiln for a bisque firing is that the pots are extremely delicate and all it takes is one tiny knock to chip or damage them, which means they need to be packed inside very carefully. A few days later, once the kiln has fired and cooled down and been unpacked, the jar can be waxed and I brush this over any area I want to remain bare clay once glazed. The clay at this point is really absorbent, like a sponge. So when I do dip them in glaze, the areas that are covered in wax simply don't absorb the glaze, as the water the glaze contains cannot be absorbed onto those areas that are sealed like this. So I coat the horizontal and vertical flange of the lid, and then the jar needs to be done in two parts. I begin by tap centering it so that I can wax the rim, which is brushed over on the very top, and I also roll it over the rim slightly, so it coats about a centimetre or so inside the vessel. If I do accidentally spill wax on part of the pot I do want to be glazed, then I'll usually just bisque fire them again, so that just burns the wax away, as otherwise it can be difficult to remove properly. Although it is possible, with a heat gun, newspaper and some sandpaper, by blotting it away slowly and then lightly sanding the area where the spillage was. I use a wax emulsion by Scarva Pottery Supplies, which I water down a little bit to just make it go that much further. 
and even though it's applied quite liberally, and it does dry quickly, so I don't need to worry too much about it drying properly before dunking it in glaze. If I didn't wax the bottom, when I dip the pot in glaze, the entire base would be covered in a thick layer of glaze, which I'd then have to painstakingly wipe away and scrape off. The glaze base would also stick to the kiln shelf once fired, and there's also a chance that some of my glazes would simply stain the clay body due to their high iron content, so it's just easier if I wax them. I then dip the outside of the pot in glaze, very carefully, right up to the waxed rim. Once fully submerged, I'll hold it in place for a few seconds, and then I'll slowly lift it out. I wasn't entirely sure how much glaze would be displaced when I dunked this, so I placed my black bucket of glaze inside a much larger red bucket. That way I'd catch and save any overflow. Once set aside, I then rotated the jar in place to remove most of the glaze from the base. The glaze surface at this point is still very soft and quite delicate, and at this stage, if I were to touch it, it would likely just peel off on my finger. So immediately after glazing my pots, I really try not to interfere with them. And if I do need to clean up the surface, or patch in any spots, I'll do it later, once it's dry. As the lid's smaller, I can glaze it all at once, held tightly with a pair of tongs. It's submerged, held underneath for a few seconds, and then removed. You can see on the underside how the glaze flows off the waxed area, and that should hopefully mean it's a bit easier to tidy up with a sponge once the glaze surface of both these components have dried, which in the summer only takes a couple of hours, but in the winter it can take days, so I tend to put them up above heaters or underneath the kiln as it's firing. Prior to glazing these, I'd made sure the workbench was very clean. That way, any excess glaze that ended up there, I can simply add back to the larger bucket, so there's little actual waste. The following day, once the glaze has dried out, I glaze the interior. Now, the reason I wait to do this is because after the initial dunk, the sponge-like walls of the pot become saturated with water as it's the water that carries all the raw materials of the glaze. And so if I tried to glaze the interior, say only 10 minutes after doing the outside, the walls would still be saturated, meaning they wouldn't be able to absorb much water and therefore they'd absorb a very thin layer of glaze. And so by waiting a day or so, it just gives the pot time to properly dry out and it ensures that I'll be able to glaze the inside with a thick enough layer. You may have noticed this drop I spilt on the side. Luckily, it's quite easy to remove and I simply scrape it away with a paring knife, attempting to make the surface as flush and smooth as possible. There's also some areas around the rim where I dabbed some extra glaze, as I didn't dunk the pot quite deep enough, and to tidy those areas, I'll just use my fingertip, like I'm doing here, just to smooth the surface out. But I don't want to fettle away too much glaze, otherwise I run the risk of it looking patchy once fired. Once the obvious parts are rubbed over, I'll check the rest of the vessel and fettle clean any small dots or specks in the glaze. Next, with a small soaked sponge, I'll clean the rim, wiping away any excess glaze that settled onto the wax, and also making the area where clay meets glaze as crisp as possible. I want the line to be straight and pristine all the way around. Every now and then I wash out the sponge. This removes all the glaze that clogs into it, which otherwise impedes this process. Once the rim's been cleaned, I'll flip the pot over and do the base. And even though it was waxed, you can see just how much glaze settles on that surface. But at least it's settled onto the wax and not into the clay body, where it could stain it. All the glaze that's removed during this process is added to the basin you can see on the left. And eventually I sieve this glaze back to my larger buckets, once again trying to waste as little as possible. This glaze can be quite an expensive material. Once the body of the jar is done, it's time to do the lid. And here I just rub down any high spots in the glaze and to make the surface as smooth as I can. During the reduction firing process, this pink powdery surface will melt and become a sort of fluid glass that covers the surface of the clay. And as it melts and softens and flows into itself, I don't need the surface to be absolutely 100% perfect, but the neater it is at this stage, the better it'll look once fired. It's especially important to remove all the glaze from this area, as it's here I'll be placing the waddings that separate the lid and the jar during the firing, as I can't just place the lid and the jar together and fire them, as this iron rich clay during the firing can stick to itself, so I need to make sure it's separated properly. On the whole this is very slow and steady work, and in most cases I usually have about three or four hundred pots to go through at any one time, and these days end up being very monotonous, whilst also focusing very intently on a high level of finish.
These are the waddings I was talking about. This is a material made from 50% china clay and 50% coarse alumina hydrate. I then add water to the powder until it's a clay-like consistency. I then roll long coils out like this and then cut them up. And these will act as the spaces in between the lid and the jar, separating the two parts so they don't touch. Yet it still means both lid and jar can be fired together, which is a bonus, as if there's any atmospheric differences inside the kiln, the two parts will still match. To attach the waddings, I simply push them against the waxed area, all the way around the flange of the lid. You can also stick them down with PVA glue if you like. Once I've attached enough waddings to support the lid, I carefully pick it up, as the glazed surface is incredibly fragile at this point, and I lightly press it down onto the jar, making sure the rim of the jar and the flange of the lid aren't directly touching. Instead, the lid is just held aloft by those waddings. And now, finally, the pots are ready to be packed into the kiln. And at this stage, none of the pots can actually touch, as otherwise their glassy surfaces will melt and fuse during the firing. But they can be positioned with as little as two millimeters between them. And this makes packing kilns with a multitude of different shapes and sizes of pots almost feel like one large three-dimensional puzzle. Equally, the process of loading them in is one that has to be done extraordinarily carefully too, as if I just lightly knock two pieces together the glazed surface will chip. Once one layer is full, I can place another kiln shelf in, which I insert carefully and balance on three props, like a tripod, which keeps each layer relatively stable. From the moment a pot's been thrown to when it's been glazed and fired, it'll shrink about 12%. This happens as moisture leaves the clay body, and the most notable difference occurs during this glaze firing, which means whilst they may be packed very tightly at this point, once the door's cracked open in a few days time, there'll be quite a lot of space around all the pots. And on the right, you can see the jar we started off with. Pink at this point, it'll be a deep dark green once reduction fired. This kiln is fueled with natural gas, and by firing with gas, it allows me to control the atmosphere and initiate something called reduction. This is when you force the kiln to fire in a state where there's not enough oxygen inside. And this basically causes the glazes that cover the pots and the clay to react differently, opening up a different world of surfaces and colours that are very difficult and sometimes impossible to replicate in an electric kiln. I'll leave a link on screen now and in the description below that discusses this process in a lot more detail. If you really want to learn more about how I fire my kiln. It's a process that takes about 9 hours from start to finish and the kiln is operated entirely by hand, meaning there's no computer or any kind of system like that to help guide you along. And towards the top temperatures, I peek through these spy holes to look at the pyrometric cones inside the kiln, which bend over time measuring heat work, as opposed to just straight up and down temperature. And once all the cones have bent over, I know it's time to switch off the kiln and call it a day, which usually happens at about 1290 degrees Celsius, which is about 2354 Fahrenheit. It's a long, loud process, and one where you need to be very present and aware in order to quickly be able to react and adjust the kiln as need be. But generally speaking, this Rhoda KG340 gas kiln fires very easily, and for about eight hours, I can just check it every half hour to increase the gas and the air pressure. And only towards the end do I need to be more attentive. This is now about 36 hours later. The kiln has cooled to about 150 degrees Celsius, and the door can now be cracked open and the last bit of hot air released. Although it's incredible how long the pots will hold their heat for. And this, the opening of the door, is always an anxiety inducing moment, as you finally get to see weeks worth of work, now clad in glaze and glassy, but not quite finished. The next step for any jar form is to remove the lid. And to do this, I gently tap it with a lump of wood, which just breaks any seal there might be from tiny specks of iron that melt during the firing and stick to the waddings. I then sand the base, the rim, and the underside of the lid, just to soften the coarse clay somewhat. And that's the pot finally finished. I don't mind it. If you look carefully, you may be able to see a slight bulge towards the base of the pot, which must be an area I trimmed just a bit too thin, which caused the walls just to buckle ever so slightly. Here are some iron dots 
pulled out through the reduction process, and I like how the glaze is broken on these three edges. And perhaps most importantly, the lid fits quite nicely. But I think next time I will trim it to be slightly smaller, so it doesn't sit so imposingly on top. Nonetheless, I always learn so much when making pots like this, especially when there are certain qualities about them I'm not particularly fond of, as it should mean the next iteration will be better. And thank you so much for watching, especially if you've made it all the way through. And let me know if you did, as it's always nice hearing from those of you who do sit through to the end of these videos. Thanks again, and I'll see you next week.